Jack Parsons got me on the moon. Jack Parsons got me on the moon. Well, hello, everybody. I hope you're all keeping well. Today is a special edition of Beyond Room 313, a cold cinema review. And I've got Tina Kemp on here. Some of you know her from her own very good uh, YouTube channel and also the pagan broadcast she does with Fiona. Now, Tina and I have been planning to do this for a very long time. But one thing led to another life got in the way. Many teen had to make a lovely baby boy. But we can now have found the, the time to talk about this. And the film we're going to talk about is Roman Polanski's 1999 The Ninth Gate, a film starring Johnny Depp and the fabulous Frank Langella. Now, the film has an awful lot to unpack. Perhaps even for me, sometimes it's too much to unpack. Unpack. So that's why I'm glad Teen is here because there's still elements of this film that still well, it's typical Roman Polanski film, isn't it? There's still elements of this film that um that confuse me. Well, not confuse me, but they're, they're like open ends. And so Tina is a big aficionado of the film, and we're going to have a talk about that now. So thanks for coming along, Tina. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, my pleasure. Excellent. Excellent. Now, let's get straight down to business. What was your first encounter with the Ninth Gate and how did it sit in your consciousness at the time? I was in my late teens and we had rented a movie when videotapes were still uh, a thing. And I was with my boyfriend and we were with a couple of friends. And there was um, a, the, an ad for it or one of those trailers before you get to the actual movie. There's always a few trailers. And I saw the trailer and I thought, I have to see this movie. And I couldn't, I didn't really know why. It was just this inner compulsion of, I have to see this movie. And when I figured out that it was playing in a cinema nearby, I dragged my then boyfriend to that cinema very reluctantly went to, went along with me and didn't really want to be there at all. And I was so enchanted with the whole movie, but I couldn't explain why. And I walked away with real confusion and I didn't know what to make of the movie, but I the intrigue was still there. In fact, I was more intrigued with it after I had seen it than before I had actually seen it. And I knew there was more to this movie than met the eye. There was things in this movie that were important for a person that uh, is into spirituality and also into occultism. And I rewatched this movie every so often and I discovered that I took something new out of it every time that I watched it. And that is why I, it's one of my all-time favorite movies because I don't get tired of watching this movie. Yes, it's, it's a real Pandora's box. And I watched it again last night just for this thing today. And there's even little things you, you notice that uh, that show up and so on. Uh, I won't go into it directly into the thing here, but the first thing I want to talk about is the most intriguing element of the film and the one that everyone remembers and is most confused by. What is your take on the symbolism of the girl? So difficult because at one at one point, and I had to rewatch specific scenes for it. That does this woman ever physically intervene in anything? And she does only once when there is the fight on the bridge. She stops that guy, but all the other times she either stops Corso directly, or she talks to him in a way that makes him change his mind. The first time that she intervenes, she also doesn't really intervene. She just stops her motorbike. Uh, and that other car just leaves then. So I, I was confused. So I watched the fighting scene again. And you, even with watching it, you could somewhat think that the physical intervention from the girl isn't really real. Because when she kicks the guy down, he lands in the same position that he got up from right underneath Corso. So did he imagine it? Did it really happen? And I think that's up for interpretation, to be honest. I think she's real in the sense that she's definitely not a human. Yeah. 
does that make her less real? No, I don't think so. I think she's a highly allegorical creature that is probably best described as his guardian angel or an angel. Yeah, that's how I initially thought about it too. But like everything else in the film, it's paradoxical and it throws you all over the place. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Before, yes, because... Before she arrives at the bridge scene in Paris, she's an intimidating um, element. She doesn't have to physically get involved. And before she starts fighting the guy, she floats down from the top of the steps to like, that's that's uh, Polanski's way of telling us she's a supernatural being. She's not a human as such and yeah like yourself the holy guardian angel you know obviously Corso is being worked through this ritual by the book himself it's really him that's becoming the uh, adept and not Frank Langella Balkan yes and at the end the missing page shows her as the as Babylon you know upon, upon the back of the great beast which is hinted earlier on with the motorcycle so, you know, I, I know it's a movie and I don't know how deep Roman Polanski's interest in the occult is, but he mixed two different elements here of a kind of a, of a traditional magic ceremonial thing about Babylon and the, uh, the Holy Guardian Angel. I think um, it's not so much Christianity that he is tapping into, but very much uh, Luciferianism, in my opinion. Because the 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 horror of Babylon is uh, again hinted at when they set chase after um, the Tesla woman with her bodyguard. When the book is stolen and they leave from the Paris hotel to her estate, they drive after her in a red car, in a red uh, convertible that she had stolen. And the signature, the, the the Luciferian thing, the LCF was on the... Uh, the on the real ones. Wood, the woodcuts, right? Yeah. yeah, and it was a joke. It was it was, it was was almost like a pun, like Louis Seifier in there. Uh, what was that movie uh, with Mickey Rourke? Uh, Angel Heart. It was the same. It was like, it's too corny. Come on. And that's... <laughs> that, that kind of threw me off that. But... I love the use of the conflicting woodcuts where they had elements in the, the real one had the real elements and the fake ones have the other ones. And Frank Langella was working from the wrong book. I thought that was genius, really. But the film has lots of humorous elements in that, like, like when Frank Langella goes boo after he kills the high priestess. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, another scenes earlier on, like the two guys in the bookshop, the old guys are, are almost like comedy characters themselves. Those guys, I found one of the creepiest characters because I do think they are not truly human beings, that they are also supernatural. Maybe they were human at a certain point, but they were absolutely aware of the power of the book because they are the ones with the last engraving. When the girl says like it was a forgery, the last one, they find it in their abandoned bookstore. They're also very dubious because they obviously lie about not forging books because they obviously do because you see it in the background that they have prints drying and all the, the, the means that they possibly need to make a false copy of anything. And immediately after Johnny Depp, uh, Corso leaves, his, leaves the bookshop, a scaffolding collapses on the street, almost killing him. Uh, that was obviously symbolism that whatever this thing that Johnny Depp was building was obviously fake and had no foundations. And the collapsing scaffolding was like symbolic of like what you think you're doing is completely groundless and has no structure to it. It's something else altogether. Yeah. And it is also in one of the engravings that he is looking at one of the real ones, danger from above. Mm. Yeah. And there's lots of tarot-like elements in the engravings as well. There's very, there's so many elements like the you know the hanged man and all that thing. Yeah, but I I often wonder. You now you know Roman Polanski is not a very nice man, and he's on the run basically from American authorities. That's why the films are made in Europe. Now, I often got the impression that the Balkan character was. Polanski's way of saying oh, these guys were at a big top at the top in America they're involved in all this stuff and that's hinted and that's stated openly all through the film 
that the big guys are into all this crap, you know, all this uh, th this this intense occult workings. I believe that to be right. Yeah, especially the, and who solidified that for me more than Balkan and his coven was the the woman in Paris in the wheelchair, because yeah. she had a, a a business almost matter of fact way about it. They are all after the same thing in different ways, but their motivations are completely different as well. The um, the Kessler woman, the the one the German in her in her apartment, she already thinks she knows it all because she is absolutely convinced that her book is the real one, and there is no changing her mind unless the proof is right in front of her. And she specifically states in the movie that she had already seen and met the devil and then the camera glances glances a little bit over her cut arm and she's german and it is around the time that she was a younger woman that she could have been involved with nazism this is just inference on my part here but um it could be that it's or she could be actually it's a very good inference because i've never considered until you said it and secondly, her personal assistant was like one of these women who were in the SS who worked, worked the death camps. Yeah, very much so. So, well spotted. The the other one, the Telfler woman, the which is the Saint Martin woman. Saint Martin is, uh, by the way, um, I looked up. I looked that up. Saint Martin uh, is an actual patron saint of the Day of the Harvest. And there is a song uh, devoted to him. November 11 is the day of my light, that my light. November 11 is the day that my light may burn. So that also is very Luciferian. <laughs> and, uh, you know, November 11 is like kind of, a, you know, you get a lot of the truth to community. They think all the pagan holy days are mm. satanic. But the one that really is, is November 11. Because in terms of the darkness stuff, because the, the number 11 represents a transformative state into other things, the final month before the darkness. And I always watch every year for November 11th, 11, 11, 11 uh, to see what's going on. And, you know, that's that to me is, you know, a lot of there's a lot of nonsense about the high occult dates out there. But November 11th definitely is one. I'm going to pay more attention to that in the future. So all the others are all pagan feast days. That the Christians are all, you know, they're all afraid of, you know, like, you know, Belton and Mayday and, you know, Valpurgis and all this kind of thing. Uh, but the real one is the one they ignored. <laughs> you know, this is what I find kind of funny. But uh, back to the movie, it has that beautiful Roman Polanski tonal quality. Everything is warm and soft. He, he, Rosemary's Baby had that look. In fact, all his films nearly all have that look. He, he knows how to create atmosphere with a film. And there's a seductive quality in that. I often felt that this film, you know, it doesn't really warn you against the occult because what happened to Johnny Depp at the end, it kind of like, so it kind of, it kind of entices you into the aesthetic of the, of the occult. And I think that's why those of us who were, grew up or had an interest in this stuff we saw, before we saw this film instantly recognized that this is nothing to be afraid of, you know. It's it's it, it, it there's a there's a genuine sense of richness to it as well. Yes, I also think that the bombastic movie would have been unpalatable for this kind of genre of movie because it does it just doesn't work. The occult isn't bombastic. It is uh, something tepid almost uh, in 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 the eye of the public i mean it's not something that you do with a lot of bells and noises have you noticed the, the homage to other films in the plot uh, the wicker man he's johnny depp's character is very similar to sergeant howie he's being led along as a kind of a patsy as a kind of supernatural huh. patsy it's a road movie it has other aspects in it too it has that it, it has that hammer kind of film feel uh, it, Frank Algera's character straight out of like Dennis Wheatley, the like the Devil Rides Out, and so on. As the he is the cartoon wealthy occult leader, you know. He, he, Polanski plays on well used tropes from previous genres, but they work because I think that the, the characters he picked, particularly Frank Langella, who played it with a lot of humor. 
And that's always one thing that Crowley said, the one element missing from the occult is humour. And oh, yeah. Frank Jealous <laughs> character, ba Balkan, actually injected humour into that. Yes, because the, the Baroness was way too stiff. If she had been the villain of the movie, it wouldn't have worked so well, in my opinion. The other one as well, the other woman, the Tef Telfer woman, she, while she is a nice counterpart to the other uh, antagonists in the movie, I don't find her a good main antagonist, except it's a sort of helping character. She needs to be there in order to get to a certain point, but to make her the main antagonist of a movie just wouldn't have worked. It's way too simple-minded to one-dimensional yes she 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 wants power she wants esteem she wants riches don't we all i mean that, but balkan wants something else he wants to transcend that and wants to ascend to godhood and he said so in the last scene right before he died which is very interesting because when he is dying when he is set on fire is the only time in the movie that we see corso do an act of kindness by killing him a mercy killing, but it's also a sacrifice because he has to be the one that kills the sacrifice, the, the sort of like the fake master, so he can become the true ascendant master, which he does a few minutes later, hence the return to the castle at the end. Uh, he... Yes, and when Balkan is doing the ritual, it's not Satan or Lucifer appearing, it's Corso. Yeah, and that's the thing. Corso is the patsy who becomes the actual ascended master. So the, the hunter becomes the hunted. You know, the cheese in the devil's mouse trap becomes the mouse trap. You know, it's so brilliant how they just, uh, Bolanski just supposed these concepts. Which is also in one of the engravings, the student uh, becomes better than the master when a fool and a king are both at the same chessboard and there are two dogs playing or play fighting in the background over, over a bone. It's highly symbolic. I also love how Polanski, okay, it's it's obviously at some levels a homage to Lovecraft's Necronomicon. All that's a, the Necronomicon was, was a very different book. It was Arabic and a different kind of magic and stuff for, you know, oh, but it did talk about opening gates like Yogg-Sagoth is the gate and that kind of thing. And the very fact, and it's, it's an amazing thing and very, very true that an actual magic book, uh, just holding it, just by being in its presence automatically uh, creates a transcendental. And that was shown beautifully in the film where he pulls a book out from a bookshelf and it's where the girl is behind the bookshelf looking at him. It's yeah. like you, you, you've now opened the first gate. You've now opened them. And I've got books here I know for a fact and they're not, even, they're not even ancient ones or anything, but just because of their gravitas, their charisma, they have, they, they just by pondering them, just by holding them, they open doors, and that was that was very key. I felt to this film, it was the it was the, the moment he became involved, he stepped over the threshold of the magic circle. Yes, mm. yeah, absolutely, and he became he developed a sort of obsession with it that transcended everything that he had been before that. Because he's a very unscrupulous man, he lies, he cheats, he's a heavy drinker, he's a chain smoker, he doesn't take good care of himself. Um, he only wants money. Through that book, he actually starts to care about something that is not himself. Yeah, he goes on a spiritual path. In fact, the book before that he rips off by the grieving couple, the Don Quixote book, he kind of becomes a kind of Don Quixote character himself. I even thought that was a clever interjection into the script. Yes. He's, he's a great main character for for a book like this, because we go from a man that is quite recognizable, somebody who have, we probably have all met at a certain point in our life, that is utterly mundane, that has no real goal or ambition other than to just make a quick buck here and there, to somebody who has become more than the sum of its parts. The, the road movie aspect of it I found very interesting too. It was done... The, the occult thing wasn't done in a building or a castle or so in per se it was done on a long journey through, through like Portugal and Spain and France and it, and from New York and that I found very interesting because it was like he was going back to the arcane world and, and to the source of all these things which is probably that castle that he ended in at the end 
And that, that you know, we always, now here's another one, and you and I spoke about this before, outside this, the significance of the tower in magic, because the tower is where the wizard resides. And he enters the tower at the end to just set, to announce to the viewer, he is the, he is now Balkan. He is the wizard. Hmm. Yes, about uh, Balkan. Uh, when you are in the beginning of the movie and you get led up to Balkan's library, there is a picture of the castle on the wall. So he already knows much more than he lets on. He already knows that the book or at least the engravings are fake. He just has no way of getting them because they all know who he is. <clears throat> and he has no way of arriving without announcing himself. He needs somebody like Corso, who is very unnoticeable. Yeah. And it, it, also the story to find the book is something of a pageant, a farce that he generates in order to put into Corso's uh, consciousness in order to achieve what Balkan wants him to achieve. The cover story, you know, this the whole thing of, it, he's, he's leading him to sacrifice. He's leading him into the magic circle to be sacrificed. But of course, at the end, we find out because of intervention by higher spiritual forces, it switches both ways because they didn't, as despicable as, and there's the other thing. There's a lot of similar Johnny Depp ca character, of course, wanted to be those rich bastards. You know, he wanted a piece of that world. It, it, by trade, but it, trading books was his way of getting into it. And so he was kind of being brought into it accidentally as a patsy, as a magical patsy. But that was an intervention by the this holy guardian angel slash Babylon woman. It was almost like to say, no, you're better than these people. As bad as you are, your soul can attain a redemption. And I found that amazing, actually. Yeah, very much so, because Balkan said it uh, himself, that he just wants godhood, that he wants to be on par with whatever god is out there. He wants to be a god. Yeah. And just like in every pagan myth out there, that, that is just the ultimate hubris of a human and he kills himself because of it. He thinks he has already attained a godhood just because somebody else he paid has all these uh, engravings collected for him. And he said it before that, when he's killing the, the, the woman in the castle with the necklace, he says that I have attained all these engravings. I am alone. I alone am worthy of the fruit of this knowledge. But he isn't. He didn't attain any of it. It's Corso that attained all of it. Because he started from nothing, and he yes. started, he, and he, 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 it was just the classic story of the fool in the tarot deck. Really, when you think about it, he stepped into consciousness accidentally by walking off the cliff. And of course, oh, right at the, to the very end, Lucifer was playing him along. There's this at the beginning of when he puts he puts down the circle of fire at the at the start. He he doesn't feel the heat from the flames, and right to the moment that he pours the the, the the petrol or gasoline on top of himself, uh, he's, he he feels no. He's been led there. It's it's at that moment that Lucifer says, "Ah, tricked, got you." Gotcha. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That, I mean, is is it because of uh, a high level of adrenaline in his body, or was it Lucifer leading him along? Who knows? Who but... knows? Yeah. I mean, what you're walking on coals. That's that's basically an induced magical state caused by you know like massive adrenaline released by the nervous system so it could have been something like that he would have been you know this is the culmination of his life's work so he would have been pumping now the fact he, he had so much adrenaline and he was able to strangle a woman with that again it was the pentagram necklace that's at the top of it which we know was the north of lucifer again so it was like that kind of thing she was a very peculiar character that one the one of the guy who hung himself I often, we made you think then again, did the guy just hang himself because he had the book or knew its secrets at the very beginning, the hanging scene? Or I think she, go on. that she, I think she is a viper. I think that man just knew that it was the end of the line for him. And I do honestly believe that he genuinely never really had an interest in that book. And she was the one that was pulling his strings all along. And then at some point he just gave up in his own way because he figured out that maybe she was right all along 
and I have no power left. It's possible within a relationship that you hand all your personal power and agency to the other person. And once you realize that, that you've sort of been led into a web of lies and deceit that that comes crushing down on you and you just off yourself. I, I think that's a, a lot of truth of that. She was, she, in some ways, she was the darkest, most darkest character of all, even worse than Balcam. And she showed her viciousness too after she realized that Johnny Depp hadn't got the book. She just became like a, a harridan, a, just a, a monster. So I think, folks, in that this half hour or so, you got a very good punch into the ninth gate from both Tina and myself to give you something to think about. If you have any more to say about the film that we didn't cover, put it in the comments below. And Tina is going to do a follow-up on her channel at some point based on your additions to this or things that have developed since this moment. And therefore, uh, I'll put the link to Tina's channel below so you can subscribe there in anticipation of it. So thanks very much, Tina, for this, uh, this yeah, very insightful but brief. And I think I learned a lot there. I definitely learned the, the Nazi occult thing. I never even thought about that one. Brilliant. See ya. Bye.